the Muisca tribe, took part in a strange religious ceremony. He was stripped completely naked, and his body was rubbed with shiny gold dust. Then, with priests and tribal leaders, he was rowed out into the middle of a lake. Along the way, he tossed jewels and gold objects from his boat, then got into the water to bathe. Members of his tribe hailed and praised him from the shore. The ceremony sparked the myth of El Dorado, the legend of the Gilded Man. Hundreds of years later, stories like this created a mad rush of adventurers and soldiers of fortune, searching for this hidden land where gold was more plentiful than water. In their greed, they carried out bloody massacres and burned whole cities to the ground. Nothing would stop them in their search for the lost city of gold known as El Dorado. Gold, the ultimate symbol of money and riches. As far back as ancient Egypt, artists used the precious metal to create masterpieces for their pharaohs, like the famous burial mask of Tutankhamun. The ancient Romans also had a passion for gold. After every military conquest, their armies would bring home as much of the revered substance as they could carry. At the end of the reign of Emperor Augustus in 14 AD, the gold reserve of the Roman Empire had reached 14,000 tons. By the year 1500, this lust for gold took on a violent streak in many European nations. The Spanish sent full armies across the sea to Central and South America in search of gold and treasures. The Spanish warriors were called conquistadors, and they were ruthless in their warring tactics, most of the time taking no prisoners. Artists and writers were sometimes present on these journeys to record the tragic events. In just a few years, Spanish troops led by General Francisco Pizarro managed to wipe out entire ancient civilizations like the Incas. Who were the Incas? Their origins are lost in antiquity. But according to a modern theory, like all pre-Columbian populations, the Incas were descendants of migratory movements from Asia across the Bering Strait that occurred 40,000 years ago when a thick ice cap connected the two continents. After reaching the northern regions of the American continent nearly 24,000 years ago, people started moving southward it was determined from ancient stone utensils discovered recently that the first settlers arrived in Peru 18,000 years ago. They built a powerful and advanced civilization on the highest reaches of the Andes. How they did this is still a mystery. The word Inca in the Quechua language means ruler or head but originally it must have been the name of a tribe that lived around Lake Titicaca, an expanse of water between present-day Peru and Bolivia that was considered sacred. At an altitude of 12,500 feet, it is the highest navigable lake in the world. The landscape is probably the same as when the conquistadors first saw it, the Indians who live there now still travel by balsa, like their ancestors did. The balsa is a boat made of tortora reed, a type of cane that grows wild on the lakeshore. The boats don't last long, 
After about two years, the reed becomes so soaked that the boat is no longer controllable and is left to rot. Like their ancestors, the Indians still use Tortora reed to make their houses, their beds, and almost all household objects. It seems incredible, but even the land the Indians live on was created by stacking numerous layers of reed, one upon the other, that, over the centuries, turned into floating islands. According to some archaeologists, it is from here, and villages like this one, that the Indians began to move north to found Cusco, the capital of the Inca Empire, around 1100 AD. Four centuries later, the Empire of the Incas covered an area that included most of Chile and Argentina, all of Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, and part of Colombia, with a population of some 20 million people. The capital of this huge empire was the city of Cusco. Situated in the fertile Vilcanota Valley in the heart of the Andes, it was considered a sacred place, a center of power. All ancient legends about the Incas began here. The city was originally laid out in the shape of a jaguar, a sacred animal. Its head was formed by a fortress called Saksaihuaman, home to almost 5,000 warriors. In the king's empire, everything belonged to the state. Money was not used, but the people were required to pay a kind of tax, a tribute, in the form of a personal work commitment called Mita. It was through this labor that Inca chiefs were able to build great fortresses like Saksaihuaman. Despite many cave-ins, we can still get a feel for the incredible size and scope of the fortress. The megalithic blocks used to make it weigh almost 100 tons each. And the three tiers of overlaying walls that protect the fortress have a perimeter equal to four football fields. How could a civilization that didn't even know about the wheel or the cart create such engineering marvels? There was nothing in these hills before them. It was basically just farmland. What they did have was 20,000 men, 20,000 builders, recruited by the king's officials, who were basically content since harvests were distributed among all the population. It was a civilization that not only could make mighty fortresses, but also major hydraulic works like the famous Tambo Maikai baths near Cusco. According to legend, the water here was considered sacred and was therefore reserved for the purification ceremonies of the king, who used to bathe in it before worshipping the sun god. By all accounts, the Incas lived a peaceful life here for hundreds of years. Then, in 1535, the Spanish soldiers arrived. Initially, they must have been spellbound by the beauty of the place, but in their lust for gold and treasures, they started plundering and massacring the native population. Cusco was stripped of its treasures. Temples were torn down, and the stones used to build their own Spanish settlement. You could say that Cusco is only partly a colonial city. The base of today's constructions, with their typical smoothed and interlocked square blocks, dates from the time of the Incas. The Spanish attempted to erect buildings from the foundations, but the structures soon collapsed due to repeated earthquakes. This did not happen to the Cyclopean walls the Incas erected, which were built taking into account the destructive forces of nature. The church and convent of Santo Domingo are representative of what happened here. They were erected on top of the ancient Temple of the Sun, the Corencancha, or Golden Enclosure, the most important temple at Cusco. Unfortunately, not much remains of its past splendor, except for a few retaining walls and some terracing. When it was new, however, the Temple of the Sun covered a square that was 1,300 feet long on each side. It included a golden garden and the Sun Pampa, with life-size golden statues depicting flowers, plants, and animals. 
Its walls were covered in 700 gold leaves, each weighing four pounds. And inside, there were magnificent treasures, including royal mummies dressed in colorful costumes, covered in jewels and gold makeup. Many of these treasures are on display at the Gold Museum in Lima, Peru. Here we can feast upon the beauty. But we're also forced to recall the unbridled passion that drove men to commit hideous crimes of murder and theft. The museum contains many jewels of Inca civilization, like this ceremonial shirt made with 13,000 gold foils, and artifacts from other nations which were ruled by the Incan Empire. The Spanish were amazed at the way Cuzco's buildings were put together. Even today you can get an idea of the Inca's building skills, thanks to the so-called stone with 12 corners. Many different stones are locked into other stones without using lime or cement. They were laid with such precision that not even the blade of a knife could pass between them. We can see how the Spanish conquistadors must have been in awe when they discovered one of the most important and sacred places in the Incan Empire, a place filled with gold statues and works of art that would make any museum proud today. But instead of preserving these beautiful artifacts, many of the most magnificent treasures of humanity were lost for all time. The Spaniards melted much of the work to make gold pesos to send back to Spain. The fate was no better for the inhabitants of Cusco. They were farmers and builders, and more or less defenseless, unprepared for a brutal enemy like the conquistadors. They were almost all massacred as the Spaniards tortured and brutalized them to get them to reveal where the king hid his gold. The Spanish were convinced that the Incas stashed away most of their treasures in cities hidden in the mountains. One of these cities remained unknown for centuries and was discovered only in 1911 by American historian Hiram Bingham. It was the lost city of Machu Picchu. Its discovery raised a number of questions. What role did Machu Picchu play at the time of the conquistadors? Why hadn't the Spanish found it? And was it really the last refuge of the Incas? So far, there is no definite answer to these questions. To some archeologists, Machu Picchu was a defensive outpost that was built to prevent hostile nations from entering Cusco through the Sacred Valley. To others, it was a place of worship, the seat of the virgins of the sun god. A temple there is dedicated to him. The temple may also have been used as an astronomical observatory. It was as close to the sky as you could get. Today, you can still see the Intihuatana, or the hitching post of the sun, a sort of sundial. It's believed that the Spaniards never reached this city, but how could they have missed such a big place? Some archeologists believe that it was so well hidden and dates so far back that Incas living around there at the time the Spaniards arrived didn't even know about it. Machu Picchu may have already been abandoned and buried in the jungle at the time of the conquistadors.
One thing we do know, Machu Picchu, even with its veil of mystery, is not the legendary land of El Dorado. So where was El Dorado, the famous kingdom of gold? A city with walls covered in gold leaf and parks that had trees and flowers made of gold. The city of every man's dream, rich beyond imagination in precious jewels and stones. Is this where the Incans fled to with their gold when the conquistadors invaded? If so, they would have had to leave the country. The myth of El Dorado is not tied to Peru. To find its true origin, we must head north to Colombia, because it is there that the legend of the Gilded Man comes from. The legend is connected with the ceremony that took place on Lake Guatavita, 30 miles east of Bogota, the modern capital of Colombia. After the Spaniards heard the story of the king, covered in gold dust and jewels, and throwing gold into the deep water, it is easy to understand why they thought the bottom of the lake might be covered with years of discarded treasures. Scholars wondered for a long time about the origin of the myth and the ceremony. And in 1954, Colombian archaeologists gave an explanation that seemed plausible. Their research showed that thousands of years ago, in a period when man already lived in the Andean Cordilleras, or mountains, a great meteorite fell from the sky. The Indians would have heard a deafening blast and seen a streaking gold mass with a trail of gold light behind it. Those who witnessed this phenomenon probably thought some powerful god had arrived on Earth. Archaeologists believe the reason the Kachike, or chief of the Muisca tribe, covered himself with gold dust and took ritual baths in the sacred waters was in honor of this event. But the origin of the ceremony was not the only mystery. Where would the Muisca have gotten that much gold to dispose of in the first place? It is known that only the tribes of the hot and humid tropical lowlands, called Tierra Caliente, had rich gold mines. There is no sign of the precious metal anywhere on the Bogota Plateau where the Muisca lived. So how could this pre-Columbian people possess so much gold that they could throw away heaps of it into a cold lake? The mystery was unraveled thanks to the discovery of mines located in the mountains west of Bogota. The mines date from the period of the Muisca and contain rock salt, the same salt we use for cooking. At the time, it was so scarce a mineral that it was worth more than gold to pre-Columbian peoples. The Muisca used to sell the cakes of salt all over Colombia, making a good profit. It was from this resourceful merchandising that the Muisca were able to buy the metal with the golden reflections and their skillful craftsmen could then turn this wonderful substance into a thousand marvelous shapes. We can now still admire these precious objects in an extraordinary collection at the Gold Museum in Bogota. With the opening of the museum in 1939, Colombia was able to stop the flow of national treasures across its borders and keep its artistic heritage intact. The museum features mummies, and beautifully crafted gold artifacts of the Muisca, along with other tribes who knew how to work gold, like the Sinu, known for their fan-shaped pendants, the Tolima, and the Quimbaya, whose craftsmen created a variety of beautiful objects, and the Kalima, who made big breastplates, tiaras, and brooches. With all this beauty, we wonder who actually wore the jewels. Was it just the leaders or warriors? Or did women also covet and wear this jewelry as they might do today? Studies of this period have shown that women never wore jewels, only priests and dignitaries. Jewelry had strong ritual and religious values. The fantastic figures evoked supernatural characters that they believed could influence life on Earth. The masks placed on the faces of the dead were meant to prolong life after death. The small, highly stylized depictions of animals, especially birds, were offered as gifts to the gods to increase the fertility of the soil 
and to guarantee bountiful harvests. Some of these incredible jewels are shrouded in a little mystery. Scholars believe that they have a perfectly streamlined shape that only a modern engineer who designs airplanes could conceive. How could they have been made more than a thousand years ago? Many golden objects used by a nobleman or a priest when he was alive accompany his mummy after death. They were placed inside hypogeum tombs, which meant that they were dug under the ground. The corpse was placed in the tomb along with jewels and everyday objects to make the soul's journey to the underworld more comfortable. Many jewels were offered as gifts to the gods. One of them is considered a masterpiece. It is a raft made of gold and emerald for the Kachike of Guatavita, which was accidentally discovered in 1969 by some farmers in a cave near Bogota. The man seated on the throne is El Dorado, the gilded man, waiting to emerge into the sacred water of the lake to obtain divine powers. Also in the scene are some men who are throwing gold offerings into the lake. Most likely they are priests and dignitaries who were escorting the king. So are there treasures then buried in the waters of Lake Guatavita? The answer, unfortunately, is no. Since the time of the Spaniards, thousands of men have dived under the water trying to find the gold. Some even tried to drain the lake, but there was never enough gold found to make it worth their while. The museum also houses jewels of the Tyrona, another ancient people of Colombia who have also died out. They made magnificent objects like serpent-shaped breastplates, and frogs, which were considered sacred and a protector. The Tyrona were one of the last pre-Columbian civilizations. They lived isolated in the Sierra Madre, a mountain range at the northernmost part of Colombia, over 16,000 feet high. It is here that stories passed down by Spanish historians about the myth of El Dorado were intertwined with legends about mysterious cities lost in the jungle with creeks brimming with gold nuggets. One of these cities was Chayarana, now an archaeological site known as Pueblito. It was here that the Tyrona Indians paved miles and miles of paths with stones to make it easier to go from one village to another. Despite these early trails, it was still not easy for the conquistadors to reach the hidden jungle cities. The tangle of plants and trees of the rainforest kept them in darkness, and it was impossible to get a sense of direction. And of course, they always ran the risk of being bitten by spiders, serpents, and poisonous frogs. What they feared most, however, was hunger. When food ran out, they ate the leather from their saddles after they had sacrificed their mules. But their hunger for riches, of finding El Dorado, kept them going. Along one of the paths leading to Pueblito, there are huge boulders on which unique depictions have been etched. Modern archaeologists believe that this was a ritual area where sacrifices were made in honor of the sun god, the figure depicted on the boulder. Thousands of villagers used to live at Chayarana in huts made of wood and straw that were built on top of stone circles. A system of canals allowed water to flow away from the huts and out of the village and prevented the risk of flooding. This is believed to be one of the creeks depicted in stories and paintings. The golden reflections are not caused by the presence of gold, however, but by mica, a mineral with similar reflecting characteristics. Ironically, the natives dubbed it Spanish gold. These are the heirs of the Tyrona people who used to live in this city in ancient times. They belong to a tribe called the Kogi. The Kogi keep certain customs and traditions alive that were conceived by their ancestors. The Tyrona had a fear of the Spanish who arrived suddenly, leaving behind only death and destruction. 
To avoid being surprised, the Tyrona laid smooth stones along the access paths to the village in such a way that they made a sound when men and mules passed. After more than 500 years, these stones still do what they were originally intended to do. Unfortunately, that signal was not enough to save the Tyrona from the fate of all pre-Columbian peoples, for whom the myth of El Dorado only caused indescribable suffering. The search for El Dorado was devastating for the indigenous native populations trying to advance their cultures. It was more than unfortunate that they fell victim to men driven by a savage lust for wealth. Although El Dorado has never been found, the search goes on today. The gold objects and jewels that have survived these ancient civilizations still inspire modern-day Indiana Jones types to hack their way through the jungles of South America in search of this lost city of men's dreams. El Dorado, the legend, continues. Central America, the Yucatan Peninsula, 8th century AD, the height of the ancient Maya civilization. In the main temple of the city of Bonampak, a fresco is commissioned by the king priest Chan Muan. It depicts 126 figures, including nobles and warriors, dancers and musicians, women and children. It also depicts some of the more bizarre practices of an ancient culture. Warriors engage in bloody battles. The prisoners they take will be sacrificed. There are also religious rites where sacrificial victims are part of the ceremony, their blood offered to the gods. The Bonampak murals go beyond the purely artistic. How could a culture considered so advanced for its time engage in such barbaric rituals? And how many cities were there like this one, where these practices were commonplace? Come with us as we search for lost cities and examine the paradoxical world of the Maya. The discovery of the Bonampak frescoes unraveled mysteries on the customs and traditions of a civilization that had developed over a period of nearly 3,000 years, a civilization that reached its height between 200 and 900 AD, and then experienced a relentless decline until it almost completely disappeared around 1500, a little before the Spanish conquistadors arrived. The cities were abandoned and slowly swallowed up by the jungle. Yet the people who once lived in them had not disappeared. They merely scattered throughout the region now known as the Yucatan Peninsula in present-day Mexico, where the ancient traditions of the Maya are still present. Archaeologist John Lloyd Stevens wrote these words in his diary on May 11, 1840, about his expedition to Mexico. In the history of the world, nothing impressed me more than the sight of this big and attractive city, now barren and lost. Stevens had set off many months earlier on the tracks of stories about cities hidden in the wild tropical jungle and a people who had mysteriously disappeared. His journey through uncharted terrain must have been difficult, 
with scorching temperatures and thick vegetation. And though on previous trips he had examined Egyptian pyramids, ancient monuments in Italy, and Greek temples in Athens, it was here in the jungles of Central America that he was overwhelmed by an intense feeling of astonishment. He walked out of the forest and suddenly realized that he had reached the ruins of an ancient Maya city, Palenque. Stevens and an architect, Frederick Catherwood, who painted watercolors of the area, were breathless when they saw the city's sacred grounds. It was clear that only men with ingenious minds could have planned this city and that expert hands had built it. It was also clear that a whole new era of scholarship on an unexplored civilization would now present itself. Gods and goddesses, rulers and heroes, an entire account of hidden Maya culture and mythic history. At the time of its splendor, Palenque covered an area of over six square miles with a population of tens of thousands. The most important structures date from the period between 630 and 700 AD when Kin Pakal and his son Chan Balum ruled the kingdom. The palace, the home of the royal family, was erected in the city center on a 33-foot high platform. The palace in reality was just a group of various buildings built one against the other, but in its own way, it was an architectural masterpiece with cellars, chambers, and rooms with rather low ceilings arranged around a courtyard. The bas-reliefs that decorate the walls are still striking today, even though many of the colors, which Stevens and Catherwood marveled about, have almost completely faded. Some glyphs, the round-figured ideograms which Maya writing is composed of, were carved into the steps of the middle court, while along the walls, stone plates were decorated with images of prisoners who must have been high-ranking officials judging from their rich garments. From the western side of the palace is a full view of the majestic Temple of the Inscriptions. In 1952, archaeologist Alberto Ruiz made an incredible discovery inside this pyramid-like structure. On the upper platform, he discovered a deep passage, a kind of tunnel that penetrated into the pyramid. The tunnel had been blocked for centuries by tons of earth and stones, so the descent into the depths of the structure was difficult and dangerous. After months of digging, Alberto Ruiz descended the entire length of the tunnel. He reached an underground room where he discovered a great sarcophagus containing the tomb of King Kin Pakal, who lived at Palenque in 700 AD. It was one of the most important. For the inhabitants of Palenque, the most important buildings in the city were those making up a group now called the Cross Group. It is composed of three rectangular buildings surmounted by a crest-like structure. They are temples dedicated to Maya divinities, and owe their name to a mistake made by the first discoverers who mistook the symbol of the Seba, the cosmic tree of the Maya, for the Christian cross. At the height of its splendor, this grand architecture in the middle of a dense jungle must have been a truly impressive sight. All the buildings were painted red to the Maya, the color of life. The main temple was decorated with stuccos portraying King Pakal together with the god Kappa, protector of the ruling class.
All the bas-reliefs of the buildings at Palenque prove that the cult of the gods was tied to the social class that worshippers belonged to. The god Ekchua, for instance, was the guardian of merchants. Even the colors used in pictures had to conform to precise rules. People's skin was colored red. Gods were painted in blue, the color of the sky, and animals and plants were painted yellow. Maya society was structured like a pyramid headed by a king who had divine powers similar to the powers of ancient Egyptian pharaohs. Below the king were the priests, nobility, and warriors. At the bottom of the pyramid was the rest of the population, mostly peasants and craftsmen. The peasants led a relatively quiet life. There were no carts on the streets since the Maya did not know the wheel. Their city markets were small and drew only a few people. You might hear the call of turkeys and see a few buyers and sellers bargaining over various goods, but most of the inhabitants had their own fruit orchards and vegetable gardens. There were craftsmen, however, who made special objects not sold in the markets. Objects made of jade. This hard, durable, beautiful mineral was so precious that only members of the nobility were able to afford it and hire the skilled craftsmen necessary to work with it. Jade objects would have been traded in one of the richest cities of the Yucatan, Chichen Itza. Chichen Itza was founded at the end of the 8th century AD and represented the consolidation of a powerful Maya state sustained by trade, tribute, and war. In the middle of town, there was a great pyramid known as El Castillo, the castle, which apparently was dedicated to the worship of Cuculcan, the Maya name of the Aztec god Quetzalcoatl. The 365 steps of the Castillo suggest that the building functioned as a giant chronographic marker, and on the days of the equinox, the sun casts a shadow that illuminates a serpent on the north staircase. Not surprisingly, Kukulkan's symbol was a feathered serpent. At the top, the Maya had erected a vaulted temple decorated with bas-reliefs depicting warriors. Only priests were entitled to officiate at ceremonies and appear in front of the population from the height where the temples were erected. The Temple of the Warriors served a different role, however, for it was here that the Maya engaged in sacrificial rites. In the early years of the first millennium, the Maya were thought of as peaceful timekeepers and sky watchers, but around 1000 AD, they encountered another people, the Toltecs, who imposed their culture and ruling lifestyle upon the Maya. Their influence is seen in the similarities between the buildings and sculptures at Chichen Itza and those at Tula, the Toltec capital, hundreds of miles away. One of the best examples is El Caracol, an imaginative building in the shape of a spiral whirl of a conch, an attribute of Kukulkan whom the structure embodies. Kukulkan was identified with the planet Venus, and from tiny upper story windows in this structure, one could observe this mythical planet. The Maya were familiar with the positions of the stars and studied their movements. In keeping track of the solar and lunar years and the cycles of visible planets, they developed a highly sophisticated long count calendar that dated back to August 13th, 3114 BC. The influence of the Toltecs is also seen in the comparison of stone sculptures from Tula called Chakmul with the one at the Temple of the Warriors at Chichen Itza. Under the influence of the Toltecs, the old system of government was eradicated. Warrior kings replaced more benign monarchs and priests. And the practice of human sacrifice was introduced. An example of this is seen in the Chakmul at the top of the stairway of the Temple of the Warriors, 
A reclining statue is faced toward El Castillo, holding a bowl in his hand. It is here where they put the hearts torn out of the chests of sacrificial victims. Sports and ball playing were part of daily life at Chichen Itza, except there was a lot more riding on the outcomes than prizes or trophies. They played a game called Pelota, and the ball court at Chichen Itza was the largest in Central America, 560 feet long and 165 feet wide. The object of the game, which was more a religious rite than recreational, was to throw a rubber ball into a stone hoop. What made the task hard was the fact that players couldn't use their hands or feet. They had to use their hips or elbows to move the ball. A bas-relief shows two teams competing against each other. But this bas-relief shows the bloody outcome. A player who was defeated is being decapitated the fate of players from the losing side. A long platform bears depictions of skulls, presumably the skulls of the losers. But according to some scholars, winners as well might have been beheaded. It was considered an honor, having won, to go to a heaven of warriors. The practice of human sacrifice was described by Bishop Diego de Landa, a Spaniard who lived in the 16th century. He himself was guilty of committing a number of crimes while attempting to convert the inhabitants to Christianity. Among these, the so-called auto da fe, or public burning of Mani, in which all written documents from this classical period of the Maya were destroyed by fire. The Maya were the first people of the New World to keep historical records with a written history that begins in 50 BC. But today, only four of thousands of books written in hieroglyphs still exist, one of which is the so-called Dresden Codex. Maya books were made of fig tree bark folded like an accordion. Although everyone could learn how to write, only priests were allowed to compile books and read sacred scriptures. The greatest difficulty in deciphering Maya writing lies in interpreting the glyphs, since they are based on a system that combines ideograph and phonetic elements. It's a complicated system that was finally unraveled by Russian epigraphist Yuri Norosev, who wrote the first Mayan grammar that was published in 1950. The territory inhabited by the Maya was vast, and since horses and donkeys had become extinct on the continent tens of thousands of years earlier, to make foot travel easier, the Maya built roads. Actually, an entire road system that linked key cities to places of pilgrimage. Uxmal was one of the most important places of worship of Maya civilization, and reached its peak between the 8th and 11th centuries AD. Uxmal was the administrative and religious capital of the Maya, who lived in the hilly zone of Pu'uk, a name also used for the region's peculiar architectural style. The finest example of Pu'uk style is the governor's palace, nearly 330 feet long, probably the seat of the authorities. The building has a cornice decorated with masks portraying the god Chak. It was originally entirely colored like all Maya buildings, and the elaborate renderings of gods and symbols attest to the wide range of Maya interests. However, the most majestic monument at Uxmal was the Pyramid, or Temple of the Magician. It was erected primarily to worship the gods of heaven, but it too served as an observatory to study the movements of celestial bodies. Like the governor's palace, the pyramid was decorated with representations of the mask of the god Chak. This sculpture portraying the tattooed face of a priest coming out of a serpent's mouth was discovered inside the pyramid.
The buildings at Ushmal exhibit the high level of perfection reached by Maya stone carvers. Not all Maya settlements were situated in the middle of the jungle. Fortified cities were also erected by the sea to make the coast safer. One of these places built by the Caribbean Sea was Tulum. This was the site of the first meeting in 1518 of the Maya and the Spanish who arrived by sea. The conquistadors had to be amazed to see such a formidable city in this beautiful natural setting. In the Temple of the Frescoes are some of the most awe-inspiring Maya paintings that have stood the test of time. There are illustrations of the gods of the Maya pantheon that dominated the universe of the living as well as of the dead. The drawings evidence a culture that was sensitive to the importance of color. Captain Juan de Grijalva landed for the first time on the shore of Tulum. He thought it looked as big as Seville in his native Spain. He would have seen buildings painted in vermilion red, light blue, white, and bright green. Unfortunately, only a few traces of these colors remain today. The castle, or El Castillo, of Tulum is certainly the most important monument of this city. It was partly destroyed in the early 20th century and was restored based upon the illustration Catherwood made of it when he arrived in Tulum. No one was sure of the function of El Castillo until Michael Kramer, an archaeologist of the National Geographic Society, reached the conclusion that it was a lighthouse used for navigation. In fact, not very far from Tulum is the island of Cozumel, which in Mayan language means place of the swallows. In ancient times, there were many vessels that sailed back and forth between the island and the mainland. The sailors of these boats probably relied on the help of lighthouses like the one at Tulum to get their bearings. The Maya enjoyed a civilization and a culture that is a study in contrasts. They had respect for nature and considered animals sacred. And yet, the animal called human was expendable in sacrifice. Blood was the mortar of Maya life. They were great historians and builders, and yet it never came to them that the wheel could be used as a means of transport. They were superstitious and feared thunder and lightning, but studied and predicted astral phenomena with modern precision. Contradictions of the Maya represent their greatest mystery. What we do know is that they spent their time in unison with the forces of the universe. Poet Miguel Angel Astorius wrote, The Maya were a people who counted their days like diamonds. They had faith in their gods, in their smoke rites, in dreams, and in the wisdom of words things that five centuries of devastation, exploitation, and oblivion 